ค่ะก็ขอสวัสดีท่านกรรมการและผู้บริหารบริษัทจัดทะเบียนนะคะท่านวิทยากรท่านผู้มีเกียรติและสื่อมวลชนทุกท่านค่ะขอต้อนรับทุกท่านเข้าสู่งานสัมมนาเซ็ตเอสดีฟอรัมสัตว์เทนเนอร์เบิลอินเวสเมนต์ออฟพอร์ชูนิตี้ฟอร์ลองเทมกรอดฟอร์บิสเนสแอนด์อินเวสเตอร์อีกครั้งนะคะโดยในช่วงบ่ายของวันนี้ค่ะจะเป็นแชร์ริงเซสชั่นในหัวข้อ how to invest sustainably sharing of techniques and implementation นะคะซึ่งเราได้รับเกียรติจากมิสเตอร์โอมาเซลิม CEO ของ Arabes Asset Management จะมาแบ่งปันประสบการณ์ในเชิงเทคนิคแบบขั้นต่อขั้นนะคะที่จะทำให้เห็นถึงวิธีการลงทุนที่ intricate เรื่องของ ESG Big Data ร่วมกับ Quantitative Investment นะคะเพื่อทำให้ทุกท่านเ,เห็นว่าวิธีการที่จะทำให้ sustainable investing ของ fund managers มีความน่าสนใจแล้วก็เข้าใจง่ายสำหรับนักลงทุนทำยังไงนะคะโดยจะแสดงตัวอย่างแล้วก็เครื่องมือเพื่อวิเคราะห์การลงทุนที่ชื่อว่า s r a y ของ a r a b e s ที่ใช้ ESG เป็นหนึ่งในคริเตเรียร่วมกับคริเตเรียอื่นๆนะคะตลอดจนผลสำเร็จและผลตอบแทนของ sustainable investment ที่จับต้องได้ช่วยลดความเสี่ยงแล้วก็สร้างความยั่งยืนในระยะยาวให้กับฟันเมนเจอร์ได้อีกด้วยค่ะในโอกาสนี้นะคะขอเชิญทุกท่านพบกับมิสเตอร์โอมาเซลินค่ะ CEO ของ a r a b e s a s s e t Management please welcome Mr. o m a r ค่ะ Thank you sir Thank you very much I believe some of you have uh, uh, heard and met me this morning some Are new. I just want to get a bit of feeling for the uh, the background in this room, so we can just adapt the program accordingly in the next hour or so. If if you could just raise your hand if you've been in there in the morning session, brilliant. We can skip a lot. Can you raise your hand if you're from the financial industry? Okay. If you're from the corporate side, journalists, media. Research, academics. Who hasn't raised his hand? What are you guys doing here? SEC. Excellent. Anybody else uh, I've missed? Brilliant. So, because we have a smaller crowd, what I would love to do is just to to um, to take you through what I think is necessary in terms of tools and processes to become sustainable. And if you could just interact, so don't let me talk for too long. Just keep asking, and we just together make this a lively program. Um, what I want to do is I want to uh, pick up some slides from this morning, but I mainly want to draw. So I'm going to pull this thing over here, and I hope that you guys can see. If I put this here, thank you so much. That's still okay for you to see. Yeah. All right. Super. Thank you so much. So, let's just cover the basics. Since we have the same language, this morning I mentioned that we have three dimensions of sustainability. The problem is that everybody uses the words and everybody has their own interpretation definition. For some, it's moral. Some it's ethical. Some it's religious values. Other people talk about ESG. Of the talk about principles of responsible investing, so it's like a whole mixed salad of words. So we just need to get some structure into this. And the basic foundation is number one is the United Nations Global Compact. So who can tell me what the principles of the UN are? Just to check how many can remember what I said a few hours ago. Um, yeah. Do you do you remember the the principles like? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Anybody else? Environment. Sorry? Environment. Environment, yeah. And, no, you're not. Social, social issues. So basically, human rights, labor law, environment, and anti-corruption. These are the four categories. And I want to explain again that this is different from ESG. This is more, more fundamental. This is normative. It doesn't matter uh, what you are, what you produce, whatever. It is a very fundamental element. So when we think about human rights, we think about governments. We think about this is the responsibility of governments. But the 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 UN Global Compact 
tries to involve corporates to carry their fair share. So it's not just the government, it's also you companies. You've got to be responsible to treat people with dignity. If you uh, wipe the dignity of people because you make them treat them so badly, then this is a human rights offense. And it makes no difference what you produce, how you produce, whatever, you're just out. It's wrong. If you commit a crime against um, the environment, if you just you know, do you know, very bad stuff like you dump nuclear waste in, in the ocean, again, it does not matter who you are, what you are, what your business is, you're just out. Say if you're on the social side, if you, on the labor law, if you just do not respect the basic uh, compensation rules or working hours, or you just treat your, your workforce like slaves. It's a breach, you're out. And finally, governance. If you bribe your way into business, you just lose your license to operate, you're out. So bear this in mind, this is the most basic foundation, the United Nations Global Compact Laws. If you are asset managers of your corporates, or you're involved in any way in this business, the first thing you want to make sure is that things are in line with the United Nations Global Compact. Now there's a slight shift in the, in the principles, not in the, in the foundation, but in the way how they express and now they introduce the SDGs. Who knows what that is? Sustainable Development Goals. Exactly. So now we have these 17 principles um, or targets or objectives to uh, remove um, poverty, give education, uh, uh, equal uh, gender equality, and, 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 and so on. So basically, from these basic principles now, they just phrase them differently as objectives, but still the same things about the core principles of the United Nations. So we got that. The next job is ESG. Now, ESG is a bit different. ESG, you got to be a little bit more sophisticated in terms of how you apply them, because you now want to compare in the sector corporates. You don't compare anymore a software company to a mining company like we do on the UN Global Compact. Because if you're on breach, you're on breach. It doesn't matter what you are. But ESG is more sophisticated. You're going to now think, OK, I want to look in the E, the environment. What's the water consumption, wastewater management? Uh, how much energy do they, come, um, uh, do they use? And there we cannot compare different sectors to each other. We need to find the right sectors. And we've got to be more detailed in the ESG analysis. And here we use uh, environmental metrics, the same as on the social side and on the governance side. So pick, for example, um, uh, take an agriculture company. So. Uh, a chemical company that produces agricultural goods. You know, what do you think should be the right metrics? What is the elements that you need to consider? Maybe. Or let me take the example I like a lot is the uh, shipping industry, so shipyards, the production of ships. You know, they, there's a, it's a very hazardous uh, work. And you have uh, ships yards where um, you have a lot of accidents and issues, and you have those where very little happens. Or another good example is the, um, the production of uh, petrochemicals, of oil and gas. So particularly now, these days, the big discussion is, oh, let's, let's be fossil fuel free. Let's not do investing in any fossil fuel. So I don't know about that, because truth is that as of today, we're all dependent on that. It's a beautiful statement if you can say, oh, I'm not investing in fossil fuels. If you made your money in fossil fuels and then take it out as a family, that's you know, cool. But then, so how did you come to this country? Did you come walking or swimming? Well, you came with a plane. It's a little bit hypocritic. You know, we're still using today fossil fuels. And the best chance of us to get out of fossil fuel is the fossil fuel industry. So again, you look at all these companies, they have from Exxon on one side, and Aramco, let's say, to um, to uh, you know the Nordic um, uh, company, so you you know they all produce um, oil and gas, 
but if you look at uh, stat oil they they use uh, solar energy for drilling they're very efficient in the way how they do it they're very mindful of the environment as they bring out oil and gas and you have others which are just really polluting the earth to get stuff out worst forms of fracking which uh, if you talk to the consultancy firms clean that up they say the earth will never be able to be used again it's just ruined forever it's poisoned you cannot use it even if it's a desert you cannot clean it anymore so what i'm trying to say is whatever there is you want to compare equals you want to compare one industry and then you want to look into what is material what matters to this company uh, what do they do what is the environmental criteria what is the social criteria what is the governance criteria so if I ask you if, you, if you look at banks, for example, what do you think is the most important element of banks in terms of a criteria to consider? Environment, social, or governance? Governance? Anybody a different opinion? Definitely governance. That's very true. U.S. banks alone paid year-to-date since 2008 over 120 billion U.S. dollars in fines. Just the U.S. companies. So if you think about, oh, you know, ESG is just doesn't matter, it's not financial relevant, it's just, you know, some marketing thing. No, 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 it's not. It is relevant. If you look at uh, Coca-Cola, it used to be the world's largest consumer of water. Until they had what they called the sea of water mandate, where they tried to rethink the entire production process. So they waste a lot of water just by cleaning the bottles and stuff, and, and they managed to reduce 10% of the water consumption which equates to six billion liters of water. It's a huge amount. Yeah. So what, what I'm trying to tell you is that sustainability really is relevant for the commercial production. So ESG is relevant within the industry, is uh, performance relevant, because you can compare how companies do equal things, how they get on with um, their work, what is their consumption of energy, of water, of other stuff, how do they treat their staff, governance issues. And the third thing is uh, personal preferences. Again, here the question is, what does a company actually do? And that is a pure question of, you know, the investor or the, the, the people who want to allocate money, if they are comfortable with that. So that is kind of like how sustainable investing started, particularly in the Nordic countries, where they say they have an exclusion list, we have a blacklist, and we're just going to remove you know, any money from these 100 or 200 names we're not comfortable with. And then that widened to a certain industry where they say, well, we are not comfortable with, let's say, uh, assault weapons or um, tobacco or genetically modified organisms or whatever. I had the, the privilege once to speak to Mr. Kofi Annan about that because it was under his time when they founded the PRI. And he was saying that they couldn't agree on anything. So when, when the first investors came together, it was such a pain. They, uh, they, they went through all the industries and they tried to come to some agreement. And they said, look, how about you know, tobacco? I said, no, no, some people like it, some people don't like it. And alcohol, absolutely no agreement. So how about weapons? No, you, sometimes you need weapons. Okay, fine, can we just agree on something? In the end, they went to offensive weapons. Uh, no, we still need offensive weapons. So then, well, how about the cluster mines? And even on cluster mines, they could not find an agreement. Because you only have people say, no, we need that stuff. So that was like when they started it. And, and today you have some broad consensus about some industries which, frankly, are questionable. So again, if I summarize the UN Global Compact as the normative principles, just the basic uh, foundation of, of humans, uh, and the way how we live together. Then the ESG, the competitive element without the, within the industry. And finally, the production. What is the company actually doing? Are you comfortable with that, yes or no? Be mindful that it's not good enough what the sector is. You have to dive deeper into where the revenues come from. So British Airways flies for back with London, New York, and they sell tobacco on their flights or alcohol, then the question is, what part of revenues is that? Normally, there's a cutoff of the 1% or 5%. So we normally take a, a level of 5%, just to be on the safe side. So as long as a company is not dependent on a certain 
service or product delivering more than 5%, it's, it's fine. And then you can dive into some specific issues. Maybe you have a view on water consumption, maybe on carbon, maybe um, it is uh, around um, um, animal cruelty is, is uh, for example, a very specific topic. We can say that we are just not comfortable with any form of animal cruelty. And again, you have a, a database that would allow you to identify companies which are in breach of the basic concepts here. You can also speak specific issues like uh, uh, trafficking, human trafficking. And here, for example, if you say, look, I'm, I'm just very um, sensitive about human trafficking, then, uh, for example, you want to have a specific eye on hotels. You know, what they do, and they are a key player, how they protect against not allowing um, human trafficking into their premises or being abused in that space. Um, and finally, uh, one, one issue also on uh, uh, child labor, child abuse. Again, very difficult to get the data, but the data is available. But if you want to really focus on this, I do not want to be involved in any company that is involved in child labor, then again, this is something that you can do as part of the ESGO, the social responsible investing. So anyway, that's kind of like the foundation. These are your values, these are your concepts. So rather than saying, okay, this is my blacklist, this is the 100 companies I'm not going to invest in, how about you saying, these are my principles, and I'm just going to build a machine that keeps searching for that? Because frankly, the companies can come and go. Why do you want to be focused if you have Apple or Google or Facebook in your portfolio? Rather say, I just have these principles, and I just want to make sure that nothing that is a breach of my principles goes through. Because frankly, companies can change, your principles don't. Your principles stay yours uniquely. This is difficult because in the past, you didn't have the information. You didn't have the transparency. Now this has changed. So I was going to tell you how we did it and how we can be of service. But please feel free to do it any other way. As long as you just feel inspired to invest sustainably. And if you agree that this is beneficial for your performance, then you should have no reason not to do it. So next topic is the information, the data. So I was mentioning this morning that historically, you know, you have these um, companies which started many years ago, did a very admirable job trying to go in the field, find out what's going on, have analysts, and they work hard to deliver their, cover their investment universe. Number one, I'll mention Stainalytics, Dutch Canadian company founded by um, PGGM in, in the Netherlands, uh, run by a gentleman called Michael Jansi. It's about 150 employees all over the world, they screen about 4,000 companies. And they have Reuters, you have MSCI, MSCI bought GMI ratings, it's for governance issues. Um, you have Bloomberg, you have uh, just a whole bunch of Ecom and then others. Basically you have these big guys and they do it like globally. And then what, what is then emerging all over the world is smaller regional ones, like in Thailand you have an excellent one in Korea and Japan and everywhere in the world, you, you get these guys. So what we did when we, when we dived into the data, we learned that some are good on the carbon or human rights or environment or whatever, but none of them cover everything. So we bought one and we tried to find out what's material, what's relevant, how they're good, how they're bad, what's the quality of the data, how accurate is the data, and how timely is the data. Often you have you know, an analyst reviewing and then so the scandal comes out, whatever, it's just too late. And then also it's inconsistent. So if you compare all these big guys and see, well, how do they now rank Apple? You say one makes it really good, one makes it really bad, and, and it's just inconsistent, you're confused. And then it's also one big issue, it's very expensive. And I, I never liked that, because I think investors, you just want to do what's right. You want to invest sustainably, and you have to pay a big amount of money, sometimes 50, 100,000, quarter of a million or half a million dollars in fees just to make it work. That shouldn't be like this. So it's biased, it's uh, often uh, time delayed, it's often inconsistent, uh, and it's often very, very expensive. So we, for us, we thought, well, we, we just build an algorithm that just sucks in all the information that's available and calculates a score on a consistent basis every day. 
So it has on one side long-term analyst views, and on the other side very short-term daily news, and it builds this unbiased screening service. And we did this for ourselves. And then many people came to us and said, well, can we please have that? We know we want it for research, for corporates, for investors, for whatever, but so we just make this available. As of 1st of September, it's going to be uh, available as a free version now, just for basic playing, but then there's a really good version uh, for a fraction of $2,500 annual subscription. Uh, we're making it available just to cover our expenses. Um, but basically, that tool is designed to help you generate your investment universe. And that's something that I would like to explain here on this chart. So just purely from the perspective of an investor, I'll come to the corporate side a little bit later. There's about 77,000 stocks listed on the planet, give or take a few. Okay, so technically this is it all in your uh, in your investment opportunity. And what you want to do is you want to call um, those stocks which permanently meet your principles. And let's say if you do this on a global scale, you're at about 4,000. So I call this the ESG screen. So UNGC is everything. I just want to give it a, a name for now. And then what often gets done is you have a fundamental analysis for beta service. And you have a momentum or quant or technical whatever driven analysis um, that sits on top of that. But basically, you want a rules-based systematic approach to this. It doesn't matter if you are selecting the stocks by yourself if you let the computer do it, or if you subscribe, or whatever you want to do, but you just don't want to be invested in stocks which are in breach of any of these basic criteria. So the first one, UN Global Compact Principles, Human Rights, Labor, and Environment and Corruption, and the system just monitors it. Second one is ESG. Third one is uh, the personal preference list, like your corporate involvement. So these three steps from an investor perspective is always critical to do. And then you can manage the money any way you want to. So many go and just take the indices, FTSE for good or UN or whatever, but you'll find a lot of issues there. If you really dig into the constituency, it's a big issue. There's also an issue about the movement of money. So obviously, historically, we had you know, active managers, very popular, hedge funds or whatever. But they frankly were very expensive. They didn't beat the, their benchmark. People are very disappointed. So money shifted en masse to indices, passive money. So if you guys can't beat the benchmark anyway, why should I pay you? I'm just going to put my money in some indices. And then the next step is, oh, I'm going to just make it sustainable. Let's get the UNGC, whatever, ESG index from provider you know, ABC, whatever it is. But there, the money sits passively, and ultimately, the whole purpose of investing is to give money to companies which do well. So you as an analyst, you as an investor, you as whatever service you do, you want to give money to companies which are innovative and hardworking, good fundamentals, good technicals, and so on. So if you just do an index, you kill the whole idea. Out of frustration, you do the wrong thing. So what, what we think is the middle ground is systemic, systematic, rules-based investing. So you just let a computer choose according to rules. So at the end, that's what normal investors do anyway. It's just a cognitive process. I think it's like in their stomach. Truth is, it's just an experience that they run through their head. And ultimately, it's, um, it's something that a computer can do better. So what I want to focus on is this part here, just for investors. So f you, know, you do here whatever you want to, but this is how we set this up. Uh, well, we have first a liquidity and a regional allocation, so you can choose an ASEAN fund or you can choose a, a Thai fund or whatever you want to invest, or global. And then you set your liquidity parameters, maybe billion dollar market cap or free float or whatever your liquidity criteria are. And then here you can set it up, and this you can do by yourself. You can say, I want to cut at the bottom 10%, the bottom 15, the bottom 20, UNGC. 
ESG, focus on the momentum. You want to invest in those who have the best ESG growth momentum. So even if a company is bad, maybe the management changed, and over six months they can prove to you that they actually now get it and they're trying to improve, and that's a strong ESG momentum. And finally, personal preference list, your selection of industry, whatever you want to do. So the way it works is a, is a data set that gets pulled in through an algorithm. Now one of the key challenges is it's not good enough just to do the big guys. We have to go into small regional database and that's what we're doing around the world. So for example, the best database for uh, child labor sits in an NGO in Sweden. This is a very rich guy who just made it his uh, mission in life to hire a lot of analysts and let them research this. It's available for free. It's not a big deal. Um, as a brilliant young company in Korea screening um, about uh, 600 Korean corporates on big data. Again, just a small group, algorithm, machine learning based. But if you wouldn't be in the business, you wouldn't know them. A company like uh, Golden Bee in China or others, which said, so what we're trying to do is we just keep collecting more and more data and just put this through. So that is kind of from an investment point of view, three steps, UNGC, ESG, personal preference list, and then in our case, we do fundamental analysis and a momentum uh, technology. That's it. Let's look more from the corporate side. Corporates are very different, very special. Uh, tell us your experience, or tell me which area are you in? Which one would you like to focus on? And then we can discuss it. Would you like to start? <laughs> yeah. um, from property, uh, we are from pace development, the Mahana Khan building. So we are more focused in the occupational health and safety of the contractors, yeah. and also the grievance mechanism from the surrounding neighbors, and, and some environment from the energy consumption. Yes. Brilliant. So your experience on the sustainability side, how you implement sustainability? We're just starting. So the way we're going to implement this, we're going to do it from, from the board, top down. Yeah. And um, I think once the framework is set, then we'll probably have to engage internally first to make sure that internally we have the same understanding and then yeah. implement it. So, so basically, that requires a lot of detailed expertise. So there's fantastic consultancy firms which would, you know, support you on this, or you do it in-house and you can do this. But, but basically, the point I want to make is that you you don't need maybe so much analysts anymore because a lot of things is just available uh, data, and you can just look and see how others are doing it, and you know how this is uh, going. But that's a great initiative and and certainly very very valuable. Important. Any other industries where you can share some information? You gentlemen? Hmm? Which industry or which sector are you in? As I mentioned, you're on the as management side. All oh, right, brilliant. So that, that would be more in line with this concept. Where Can you explain how you're doing sustainability now? Are you, have you started already or are you just looking at it? We use a concept called ESC integration. Um, by Basically, we start from the fundamental analysis but we integrate the ESG factor into every step that we, we, we forecast, we analyze for, for stock make to make sure that um, we consider this as an ESG risk. So the valuation will not be the same for, for some company within that sector. Yeah, okay, brilliant. Okay. So one, one interesting thing is for investors is that uh, the UNGC and the ESG is mainly to protect investors against reputation risk um, and tail risks. So it's uh, in our system, for example, we uh, excluded, I mentioned Volkswagen this morning, or Vyland, or Tesco, or Toshiba. And that's quite interesting. For example, Toshiba was a, a governance scandal. You know, they obviously cooked the books in the end. And the reason why we did manage to exclude them is because we have a, a forensic accounting uh, uh, screening built in as part of the governance. And that forensic accounting is a function that runs between 0 and 100 and has 10 deciles. And the only thing we do is we, we exclude the bottom 
And we can prove to you that if you remove the bottom 10%, that that universe runs better. Interesting enough is also, you need to take into consideration what the leverage ratio is of the company. So the point I want to make is that there is a connectivity between how strongly a company is leveraged and the likelihood of fraud. Why would you think that is the case? Anybody? So in other words, is the likelihood of fraud higher if a company is leveraged more or less? What would you say? More. Or why would you say that? It's your money. <laughs> Spot on. You're 100% right. Exactly. So that's quite an interesting thing. So if, if the company is uh, low leverage, let's say we cut off at a third, then the, why would they cheat? It's their own money. And normally the companies in the bottom third, you know, they're just much more safer in terms of fraud than when they're in the middle sector, which when they, you know, maybe start to expand. And then they come to the point where they stand with their back against the wall. Maybe then it doesn't go well. And then they go to the top third. And that's when they start to consider fraud. So you kind of wait until then. You, even in the middle, you're already exposed because you don't know which way they're going to go. So you want to stay in the sector where companies are uh, just a third leveraged. So the point I tried to make earlier this morning is that, you know, okay, this is a simple analogy. We can just look at it and, and figure it out. But if you consider all of them together, like what's the relation with the leverage ratios and cash ratios and, and you know, environmental topics and how they treat women and how the governance structure, that's really where it becomes interesting. And this you cannot do as a human just reading. You just need to program a computer to look for that. And that's where it becomes really interesting. And you will find most interesting correlations. So what I'm trying to say is this is um, a strong risk of reputational issues. And then there is the, you know, the tail risk. So sudden unexpected, like the Volkswagen. Volkswagen was given by Rubico Sam three years ago the highest ESG standard. They were considered the world's most sustainable company. They got this bigger, big award. And next year, they turn out to be a complete fraud. So it tells you, forget the awards. <laughs> and and uh, it was a governance scandal. And again, we out-selected them. We didn't predict an environmental issue. But what we knew is there was strong frictions between Mr. P and Mr. Porsche, the two cousins. And there was big issues about three years earlier with the unions. I don't know if those of you who might remember when, uh, when Rolls-Royce uh, sold um, Bentley and Rolls-Royce to uh, BMW and Volkswagen. And um, Volkswagen um, had the, the Bentley brand. The head of the unions, a very powerful guy in, in, in Volkswagen, refused to accept that he had to sign off. And in the German board structure, half is representative of the union, half of the capital. And he was bribed by the CEO to sign and to accept. And his condition was, I want the same salary like you. And he, he did. And then there's a lot of inappropriate stuff I cannot mention here. Um, and in the end, uh, it was a consistent um, uh, element of, uh, of, of bad culture behavior, governance behavior, that led to that. Another example is uh, Siemens. Siemens in Germany, which obviously are very efficient German, they, um, they bribed governmental contracts. They even had uh, this uh, tax deducted. So can you imagine they, they, they had a department for fraud and this department had a budget of 500 million euros and they spent it to, to bribe governmental uh, entities in order to win big nuclear mandates or contractual stuff. In the end it cost them just 2 billion euros of fines plus of course the reputation that was gone and, and all the other issues.